Welcome to the Fairport Quarterly Town Hall. I'm Deborah Feldman, Managing Director at Fairport's Buffalo Grove office north of Chicago. Today, we're welcoming clients across all offices, including Cleveland, Chicago, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Buffalo, New York, and Princeton, New Jersey. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Friday afternoon. At least right now in Chicago, it's beautiful. I'd like to take this opportunity to celebrate some news we shared earlier this week. Please join us in congratulating Matt Bogar for taking the reins from Ken Coleman as CEO of Fairport Wealth. Ken is retiring after nearly 25 years of leadership, taking the firm from a well-respected RIA to the major industry player it is today. It goes without saying that Ken's warm, charming personality and leadership abilities will be missed by everyone. We wish him every happiness in his next life adventure. Much has been written about a succession crisis in our industry, and we're fortunate to have been able to have Matt Logar on staff for the past two years, working with Ken to facilitate a smooth transition. Additionally, we've all had the opportunity to gradually get to know Matt, and I know I speak for everyone at the Fairport Enterprise when I say that he's earned the respect and admiration of us all. We host these investment town halls regularly on a quarterly basis with the intent to connect with you directly. And you'll get to meet our chief investment officer, John Silvis. Today, John will recap where we've been, his thoughts on where we are today, and his opinions on the future direction of the markets. We ask for your questions in advance and John and his team have prepared slides addressing those and other frequently asked questions. While your investment advisors are in continuous contact with the investment team, we want to let you know that you can also hear from them too. You should be receiving Fairport perspectives via email. This is where we provide timely content put together by John and the investment team. If you're interested in weekly updates, please ask a member of your advisory team to share our Fairport Wealth Market note that comes out on Tuesdays or Wednesdays. You can also subscribe to our Fairport Flash, a monthly podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or Spotify. Finally, you can follow the hashtag Investing with Fairport on LinkedIn and Twitter for frequent thoughts on the markets and the economy. As always, your cameras are turned off and you're muted on this webinar. However, if you have questions that pop up, you can type them into the Q&A part of your toolbar and we'll answer as many as we can, time permitting. And with that, I'm going to turn the microphone over to John. Thanks, Deb, I appreciate it. And I can tell you, at least here in Ohio, um, I think we're in the mid 60s, maybe high, low 70s, so it's gonna be a good day. I know my grass needs to get cut again, so um, <laughs> we're off to a pretty good start here for spring, which is normally uh, not the case. Our our, uh, our winters kind of go right into summer sometimes, but uh, this year I think we're actually going to have a spring. So looking forward to it. Um, so like you said, we're going to kind of go through the first quarter review. It's it's uh, it's kind of crazy. I was sitting down thinking about it. Uh, it's we're three years removed from the market bottom in March of 2020. Uh, it seems like it was yesterday. I know a lot's happened over those. Uh, three years, but I think March 21st, I think was the day the market bottomed. And uh, obviously, uh, most of the data we have right now is through quarter end of March 31st of 2023. So about a three year period. So kind of keep that in perspective as we go. Uh, um, a lot of ups and downs and a lot of restarts as as we've gone through that, that last three years. But, uh, you know, equities continue to build off the gains we had last year uh, at the end of 20, I'm sorry, build off the gains we had at the end of Last year, uh, the fourth quarter of 2022, I think was about four or actually 7%. Um, as you can see on that third column from the right, year to date numbers, uh, the second one down that I'll call it the olive green is uh, large cap equities, which is the S&P 500. We're up about 7.5%. So we've had two quarters of consecutive positive growth. That tends to be a pretty good sign that that the the worst is over or the bear market is is behind us. Um, you know, there's always exceptions to that rule, and uh, I never never like to use the time. Uh, you know, this time is different, but you never know. But it tends to be a good sign, so I think I think that's um, a good way to start the year. Um, you know, another thing, as you can see in that third column from the right, 
uh, developed markets or, or international equities, which is basically uh, Japan, Europe, uh, developed international companies. I've actually done a little better. I think that's mainly due to the dollar. And we'll talk a little bit about the dollar uh, as we move forward as well. Uh, small caps uh, tended, tended to be weak during the quarter. Uh, people may not realize this, but there's a lot of financials and in small caps, especially community banks. Community banks have been under pressure recently, so that's one of the reasons there. But um, you know, overall, I, as we set out at the beginning of the year, and, and, and I'll say it again, I, I think we're going to see a year where both equities and bonds are positive, which have positive returns for the year. I, I won't speculate how high those those returns go, but um, I think we're going to see positive returns for both equities and fixed income, and, and so far we're off we're off to that. Um, so far this year, again, fixed income or the ag's up about 3%. Uh, but, you know, as I said, we're, we're kind of at that three year anniversary of the market low. So I went back and I looked at some numbers just to put things in perspective. Uh, over the last three years, the S&P has been up about 18% a year. So I know we've had a couple of big, big moves in there. Obviously, 2020 was a big year, at least the second half of the year. Um, the last five years, the S&P has been up 11% a year. So, uh, the last year and a half, we've, we've seen some volatility. We've hit, had a correction, but but over the over the last three to five years, which I think is kind of the, the, at least as long as you want to be in equities, you don't want to be a short time investor. Returns have been pretty pretty solid. The uh, bond index or the AG, as we call it, the, uh, the Bloomberg AG, uh, the last three years has been down about two point eight percent a year. So it's definitely struggled. Most of that came last year and. 2022, but over the last five years, it's up about 1% a year over five years. And then international equities were, were pretty much the same, 15% uh, a year over the last three years and about 7% over the last five years. So, you know, we're still seeing positive returns. We're obviously in one of these correction phases. We've seen uh, what is likely a bear market last year. I don't know if that's if we're officially at the end or not. That's something we're keeping a close eye on. So, you know, as we go into it, I think there's five things or, or four things we're really looking at. Uh, some of these were last year, but I just kind of put a framework to our discussion today. I think one is inflation. You know, where is it going? Uh, we've talked about that a lot over the, over the, the last year and a half. Last year was about how inflation was going up. Hopefully, this year's discussion is how inflation is going down. And so far, we've seen that. I think the other one is the Fed. Uh, Fed policy, they were tightening pretty aggressively last year. When will that end and how soon? And will there be cuts this year in, in that fashion? So I think that's another thing we're looking at. Different different view from last year, but kind of still in, in the headlines. I think the third one is the recession. You know, it, it, it's probably the, um, you know, I was, I was on spring break last week and I said it's the best recession I've ever seen because people were spending money all over the place. But uh, there's a lot of speculation that we'll see a slowing of the economy and a recession next, uh, either uh, second half of this year or in the next year. So that's something we're keeping a close eye on. And I guess the fourth thing that, that, that we're watching pretty closely is earnings. Um, we're right in the middle, we're almost in the middle of first quarter earnings. Uh, Procter & Gamble reported this morning, it's a pretty good uh, indicator and in, in, in their numbers were uh, uh, better than expected. So that's a good sign. So that's another thing we're watching. And we'll talk a little about those. So th those are kind of the areas I think that we're going to keep a close eye on as we go forward. Uh, you know, I do think history is kind of pointing to further gains this year. Uh, you know, there, there's a, a, a study out there that if you hold the December lows, uh, it's, it tends to be pretty important, especially uh, uh, as you can see here, there's a red circle in the middle there. If you hold the December lows from the previous year, um, it tends to uh, give you better indication of the markets going forward. So, as you can see here, uh, on average, it's about 18 percent. I wouldn't be so much concerned about the average, but it's just the trend that tends to be positive and you get a higher return about 94 percent of the time. Now, if you break the lows of December uh, in, in, in the first month, then, uh, as you can see on the right there, it's about a 50 50 coin flip if you're going to be positive or not 48 percent. So. So far, uh, I think we're off to a good start. You know, that goes back to 1950. So there's plenty of data, data points in that. Um, and then, you know, uh, one or two more here and, I'll, and, I'll, and we'll, we'll I'll move on to the economy. But, you know, again, talked about this the previous one, but 
if you go back to that first chart that we showed with the quilt, what we call the quilt chart or the periodic table, only one asset class so far this year is in the red, and that's commodities. So as we saw with those ar the, the arrows on here, when you tend to have a lot of asset classes or mutual fund categories in this case, uh, negative, next year tends to be pretty positive. And so far that's playing out this year. It's only, we're, we're, you know, we're less than four months into the year, but so far it's a good, it's a good sign. So I, I kind of feel like uh, we're in, in, we're in a return to normalcy uh, here in this post pandemic world. Now, Deb, I'm going to, I'm going to quiz you if you don't mind, uh, you know, do you know what president used the term return to normalcy as his uh, campaign slogan? Oh man, no, I don't, John. You're right. making me look bad. Uh, that's okay. It's a tough one. Uh, he was only president for a while. It was Warren G. Harding. Unfortunately, he had a heart attack and died two years into his term, so he wasn't president very long. But uh, 1920, so he used to, he used the term return to normalcy. Um, hopefully, for my Cleveland friends, they know that he's one of eight presidents from the state of Ohio. So mo most most of any any state. But anyway, so I think we're kind of in this return to normalcy a little bit. Is uh, you know, I again, I went on spring break. I didn't see very many masks in the airport. People were packed. This is a good chart here. There's a red arrow there pointing. This is movie theater visits. I could have showed you uh, TSA visits, you know, whatever you want to call it. But people are are are, are back and out. So um, movie theater visits are now above back above where they were for in 2019. So I know there's a lot of blockbusters coming out this summer, and I'm sure people will go back to the theaters. But I kind of feel like I don't want to say we put the pandemic behind us, but from a from an economic standpoint, it seems like you know we're uh, the markets and and consumers are moving forward. So I, I'll kind of pause it there. You know, that's kind of where we're at so far this year. Um, happy to take any questions uh, either now or if you have any. Well, this is interesting. I actually have um, a comment from um, one of the listeners who's saying Warren Harding had one of the most corrupt administrations. He, he did. There was a teapot something. Uh, uh, I'm not advocating for his policies. I'm just using the slogan. But um, I think it was the teapot scandals. There are several, but yes. And and to be fair, he was only in office for two years, so it very well could have been a T dome T dome scandal. Okay, I was close. T dome, yeah. Uh, so yes, uh, yeah. I'm not using him as a a role model, just the slogan. <laughs> well, you know, we've been getting a lot of questions on the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. Clients are nervous that we're going to have a financial collapse, like we did in 2008. What actually happened with the failure of these banks, John? So, uh, got a, I have a couple of slides on it, which we'll talk about. But you know, uh, you know, again, I don't know. I, I've used this analogy, so I'll, I'll use it with, with uh, our friends here. Uh, for anybody who's ever watched uh, "It's a Wonderful Life," you know, there, there was it's kind of was an old-fashioned run on the bank. Uh, a couple of things: one, they take in deposits. And they bought treasuries on the deposits. So that's one thing that they did instead of loaning it out. And then um, they bought, again, this goes back, let's go back to that period I, I just mentioned in March of 2020 or shortly after, rates were very low. So they were going further out on the curve to try to get a better yield on, on the deposits that they were receiving. Um, but what happened, rates have gone up. Those, So there's an inverse relationship between price and yield. So as a as, uh, yields went up prices come down and they have to realize those losses on their books the banks and that that's kind of one end of it which is which was unfortunate for them because they had deposits leaving uh and we've seen that ourselves we've taken money out of deposits and putting it into money markets or taking out a deposit in the treasuries so there's outflow in silicon valley a great example you know there's 92 percent of the, the dollars they had in deposits were above that two hundred fifty thousand dollar FDIC range, so most of those were uninsured deposits. In theory, if the bank would go under, the, the Federal Reserve uh, would cover that two fifty, not above it. A lot of Silicon Valley banks use uh, use that to do payroll and other things. So there's they had large sums of money there, so they were all instructed to pull those deposits out. Well, once everybody kind of goes electronically, so to speak, there's a run on the money. And, on the bank and they pull those out, uh, you know, they get 
for lack of better words, upside down. And then they have to get uh, help from the um, regulators. That, that's pretty much what happened. An interesting side point to that, uh, we, um, I, I sit on a committee uh, for a private family foundation uh, investment committee, and uh, we work with a, an investment consultant, and we were looking at a venture fund who, who had um, investments out on the West Coast as this was happening, and we, we kind of asked the question if they were involved in all this. And they actually said that a lot of people are actually putting their deposits back in Silicon Valley Bank now that the, the Federal Reserve and um, has you know kind of backstopped them. So I don't know if the worst is over on that. I don't want to go out on a limb on that, but I think you know that that initial um, contagion has kind of been been uh, uh, stopped. Uh, we'll see. The Signature Bank was in New York. They're another one. They they, they were more related to crypto, but kind of the same process happened with them. Um, First Republic's one out there that's been under pressure. They've gotten some deposits from some of the other banks uh, and it seems to be stabilizing. So I don't want to say we're totally out of the woods, but it seems like it's um, it's definitely has uh, calmed down. If you look at the, the banks from uh, JP Morgan, Bank of America, both reported earnings, they seem to be pretty solid as far as their, uh, their balance sheets go. They did see deposits. Um, in some cases leave, but they benefited from a lot of people going to a flight to safety, you know, going to the places they thought were had the, the best chances. And so, um, you know, there's always a financial crisis at the end of a uh, Fed tightening cycle. Uh, Evercore ISI will have has a whole list of them. It could be uh, long-term capital management, uh, the Asian uh, currency debacle back in the 90s, uh, you know, you can go down the list, the housing issue, housing market. Um, so the, everybody's kind of waiting for some type of uh, misstep. And, and I think this, you know, this one we're in with the banks um, might be the one that, that causes the Fed to hit the pause button. So. Um, Good. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, let's, let's jump into the economy. Uh, I do have a couple of slides on there. Uh, uh, on the banking issue, uh, and, and I'll pull those up as we go. But um, so, as I said, one of the things we're looking at pretty closely is the the economy and, and in, where we're at. Uh, a lot of talk about recession, uh, second half, first part of 2024. Uh, no one really knows that. It's kind of been uh, batted around. But so far, the economy is kind of holding in there. Uh, we're going to get first quarter GDP numbers here uh, uh, in about a week. Um, so far, you know, Atlanta Fed uh, GDP now uh, econometric model, which you know, I think is the best out there. It's the most consistent. It's about 2.5% GDP growth. JP Morgan just raised theirs to three and a quarter. The average out there from Refinitiv is about, uh, Refinitiv survey is about two. So I think, you know, we're, we're likely growing somewhere between two and 3%. That'll be the third quarter in a row of positive GDP growth of 2% or more. So I think, you know, the economy is on pretty firm ground, at least it has been. It's just how fast are we slowing going forward? And I think there are a lot of signs of that. Um, you know, we use the Evercore ISI company surveys. It's, it tends to be a good real-time indicator. And as you can see here, you know, it's definitely starting to wane. I think the last time we spoke, was just, it was slightly above 53. It's about 51 right now. So it's definitely coming down. That 45 is the line in the sand where it tends to uh, indicate that you're going into a recession. So that's something we're keeping a pretty close eye on. And again, it's it's real time, you get weekly data. So it's something we're watching pretty closely. Um, you know, there are things that we're watching on employment rate probably has to get above 4% for um, in uh, a recession. I think we're at 3.5% now, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you know, earnings growth, as I mentioned before, we're looking at, we're looking at uh, the unemployment claims that come on on a weekly basis. So. I wouldn't say there's enough data points out there to say we're in a recession, but I would definitely say that you know things are slowing. But the, the trucking survey, which tends to be a good a good indicator on the direction of GDP, is definitely flirting with that that solid line through 30, call 37 and 40, and um, it's at 38. So that's that's an area that we're concerned about. So that's one area that is probably flashing a recession out there. But you know, on the on the plus side, inflation definitely is starting to come down. Uh, supply chain disruptions are over, um, you know, so that's 
a good sign inflation is likely to peak. We, we believe inflation peaked back in June of last year at 9.1%. As you can see here from the uh, global supply chain index, uh, New York Fed puts this out, but just from a directional standpoint, from December 21 uh, to, you know, to where we're at today, you've seen a, a pretty big pullback there. Um, this is probably my favorite chart over the last year or two. Uh, this shows you uh, where historically the Fed fund rates have been. That's the blue line relative to inflation, CPI, consumer price index, which is that pinkish uh, column. And I think when we first started showing this, there was about a 6% gap between that. One was at 8% on CPI, and I think the Fed was at 2%. That's come back to be about even. They're both uh, at 5%. Uh, I think that's likely saying that we're pretty close to a pause. We probably get another rate increase in May, on May 3rd, I think they, they meet. But then after that, I think there's a good chance as inflation starts to, again, creep down into the fours, we're going to be in that area where the, uh, the Fed funds rates above the CPI and then the, the Fed can start to talk about pausing. So um, I don't know if it's going to be the next meeting in May, but I think we're pretty close to the end. And then I think, you know, the, the shift will be, as it always has been, is when will they start to cut rates? And, you know, that's that's a whole other argument. Uh, I don't think we're we're ready to have that discussion yet. So. Um, so uh, I'll pause there, Deb. I, I saw something pop up. I didn't I wasn't able to read it, but I don't know if there's any questions out there. Annika, is there any questions? Um, there are a couple. Deb, do you see them? You may have lost her. Oh, no. All right, I can read it for you. Um, is there a real risk of credit default by failing to compromise on the debt ceiling? And if so, what are the ramifications? So I was hoping to dodge the whole debt ceiling issue. I was not going to bring it up. I hope no one else did. Um, so, I, you know, like like any other time you go through this process, I, there's always a chance of default. I think, you know, the, there's a lot of posturing. Um, you know, the the political climate is way more polarized than than they have been than it has been before. So, I think that kind of heightens the the concern. I, uh, Speaker McCarthy was out there. From what we've understood and what we see from the, the, the policy analysts that we we watch is, you know, the, 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 the House has to prove they can pass a bill. They have to pass some type of bill, send it to the Senate, then it will be the Senate and the president, because the Senate's run by Democrats, to come up with a counteroffer to that. But President Biden, and I don't blame him for this, is not going to negotiate against himself on this process. He's waiting for the House to come up with a bill. I think if, if we get to the point where there's nothing uh, moving, my guess is we'll see some type of uh, continuing resolution to be able to push it back out enough time. I, I think that the the chance of default is is low. I wouldn't say it's zero, uh, but I still think it's pretty low from from the analysts we follow and, and Dan Clifton from um, Strategus is one of the best out there. You know they they're putting less than a ten percent uh, chance we'll see a. Um, a default or anything like that. So uh, the, the X date keeps moving. X date meaning when when that um, uh, point of no return is. I've heard July could be August. It depends on spending and a couple other things. So um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Annika is one of our marketing uh, specialists, and she does most of the heavy lifting behind these uh, podcasts. And uh, I think she's going to be my co-host here as we go forward. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to jump in the markets unless there's any other question. Uh, no, go ahead. Okay, great. So, you know, as we get into the markets, we've had a pretty good run this so far. Uh, we're seven. Uh, well, I'm sorry. We're uh, uh, a little, little more. Uh, I was going to say halfway through the quarter, but we're not even halfway through the quarter. So we're just a little bit into the, into the second quarter. Uh, valuations as of March 31st, end of the first quarter have bounced. They're up about 17.8 uh, times forward earnings. You know, that's that's pretty rich. Uh, I won't, I won't uh, dispute that, getting close to that 18 times. I think most of what we've seen so far over the last, um, the last few months, uh, beginning of the year, 
has been multiple expansion. So uh, markets are moving up because the multiples have expanded. You can see that in the chart there. Um, yeah, you know, the second part of needs to see some type of stability in earnings, and then uh, we'll see where multiples go. I, I do think as we get closer to inflation, getting down to that 2% target, and I don't, I don't know if we'll get there this year, but I think, um, you know, it, it'll continue to move in that direction. Uh, you know, 17, 18 times is probably where we'll see the multiples end up. Um, but, but, you know, that, that remains to be seen, remains to be seen how sticky inflation is. If we get stuck around 4% for several months and then maybe that, uh, that resets things going forward. But, you know, our, our, our thought is we're going to see inflation continue to kind of drift lower here. Um, and, and, and then, and then there may be a discussion on, you know, is it going to go too low, but that's, that's probably further into 2024. Um, as I mentioned, the earnings, you know, we are in the middle earnings season. Uh, as you, there's a, this is from Goldman Sachs. There's a red box around that 7% in the first quarter. Most people believe we're going to drop around 7% from a, a year over year, uh, standpoint. So far about 20% of the S and P has reported. Uh, eighty percent is beaten expectations. That's that tends to be a good thing. Uh, it's better than expected, and most likely, if you ex uh, um, if you if you draw it out to the end of the year, the, I'm sorry, the end of the quarter here, the trend's probably closer to a negative six percent than negative seven. So we're coming a little better than expected. Um, most people are expecting this to be the the, the low point, and so far, uh, it looks like it's holding up, and uh, you know. Earnings as a whole held up better than expected. Uh, you know, next week we move into some of the tech names, some of the bigger names like Apple and stuff. So we'll see how that that plays out as we go forward. But it's definitely something, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're keeping a pretty close eye on. Uh, Deb mentioned earlier about the bank issue. Uh, you know, the bank stocks have come under pressure, uh, especially some of the more regional banks, the smaller banks, um, um, Key Bank, PNC, not to a point anybody out, but uh, fifth, third, those type of banks, uh, the bank index here has dropped 45% uh, from the from the high back in 2022. Uh, it's an area that, that, that we have some exposure to, but we don't have any uh, exposure to the, the regional banks. And I don't see us adding to that anytime soon. Talked a little bit about why, so I won't get into that again. But um, I think, you know, the main reason is you know, money market yields have gone up. They're around four and a half percent, four point seven percent, depending on where you're looking. And deposit rates that that gold line down there uh, has still remained pretty low. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, everyone's a little different, but the disparity between what you can get at the deposit rate versus what you can get in money market has been uh, a near all time high. So people are taking money out of the banks, putting them in different higher higher yielding. Uh, Securities, either money market or, like I said, some people are putting it in three, six, nine month treasuries as well. Um, I think that's going to continue until uh, rates start to come down. Uh, it seems like the the rush out of deposits has slowed, though, uh, which is a good thing. Um, so I'm going to skip over this last one. It just uh, show this one here just shows the pace of of um, of uh, the Fed tightening, um, but so you know, as, as you look out here, and I think we're like I said, we're we're, we're probably nearing the end of the Fed cycle uh, tightening cycle. I don't want to say for sure it's the next meeting in May, but if, I think we're getting closer to May meeting and a June meeting. I would think one of those two is probably where they stop or at least pause. Um, and you know, history will tell you, uh, you tend to do pretty well once that happens. So the average stock performance um, twelve months after the Fed the last hike. And that again could be in May. Tend to be pretty positive, uh, you know, on average about twenty percent uh, in stocks, and even bonds do well uh, as rates start to come back down. So, uh, you know, what maybe some of that we're seeing now is anticipating that. Um, so I see Debbie back with us after her short uh, vacation uh, step away. Uh, I, I, already, I, already, I, I already introduced I, Annika as your as your replacement, but you can step back in if you'd like. <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't even, I don't know what happened. All of a sudden, I just was bumped out, but Annika got me back in again. Thank you. Um, no problem. Can I circle back to the economy? Because there seems to be a tug of war between 
the stock and bond markets. The stock market is at historically full valuations. Do you believe there will be lower earnings in the coming quarters? I know you mentioned. Yeah. That. So, so, you know, th this quarter, uh, if you play it out, the expectation is about a 6% decline year over year, which is a little better than what they thought going into the quarter, which is about 7%. So, you know, it's about, in, I call it about in line or slightly better. And then there's, there's expectations that we should see a decline in earnings next quarter. Uh, so that'd be the, the second quarter, the one we're in now. And then hopefully, uh, you know, we'll start to see better returns going forward or better earnings going forward. Um, so I think, I think we're, I think we're close to a, um, a bottom. And what, I, and what I mean by that is, you know, the markets will start to discount that and they'll start looking at earnings in 2020. You know, by the time you get to June, you know, third quarter earnings aren't that important. They're looking at what the guidance is for 2024 and what 24 earnings are. And I, I call me an optimist, but I think we're going to see earnings bounce back next year. Cause I think if we do see a recession and, and I, I'm not, 100% sure we will, but if we do see one, uh, I think it'll be so far, it seems like it'll be a shallow one. And if it's a shallow recession, earnings probably won't be as bad as some anticipate. But there are some on the street that, you know, think that earnings will be, you know, severely um, hit here over the next few few quarters. So, uh, you know, again, it's, as I mentioned at the beginning, the four things we we're looking at, earnings is one of the ones I think we need to get some clarity on going forward. So. Uh, it's definitely high on our list. It appears that the fiscal policy is stimulative right now with additional money yet to hit the economy. And, you know, we're talking about the infrastructure bill and CHIPS Act. Mm -hmm. and yet the Fed is still raising rates to stem the tide of inflation and slow down the economy. How do you think these conflicting policies will play out in the 2023 economy? So, so you're right. You have one that's a, uh, a stimulus, and then you have the Fed tightening, which is, you know, technically trying to offset um, all the stimulus it did prior years uh, on the monetary side. Um, I, I, so, you know, one of the key points for Speaker uh, McCarthy is to uh, rein in spending or have some kind of built-in spending cuts or or spending limits uh, in some type of agreement with the president uh, to pass the debt ceiling. I, I don't know if we'll get that passed. I think it'd be very watered down, if anything. Um, but, uh, you know, it's Washington, D.C., so the right hand doesn't always know what the left hand's doing a lot of times. So I'm not surprised that it, on one end, you have the president passing uh, two, two pretty, I think they're both about a trillion dollars, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe a little more. Uh, two bills uh, because, you know, he, he's got a re-election cycle coming up and then um, the Fed is looking at the economy as a whole on a macro level and they're, they're trying to slow, slow prices and in, in inflation. So uh, we'll see how it plays out by the end, by the end of the year. I, I don't, I don't think Speaker McCarthy is going to be very successful getting uh, any major spending cuts, but I could, I could be mistaken. I think there's a lot of money that's, that's out there that's not spent COVID that can be pulled back. That's kind of an easy win for everybody, but uh, we'll see. But uh, I will tell you, you know, the CHIP, the CHIP Act uh, is a big thing here in Ohio. Uh, everybody's excited about it. They're building a big uh, Intel plant down towards Columbus, and there's thousands of jobs being uh, brought in over the next couple of years. So um, if you asked, I'm sure if you took a poll here, it's pretty popular. And, and and just by coincidence, our uh, our senators up for re-election. So. And they have <laughs> so, uh oh, do we lose her again? All right, I'm going to move on to the. Possibly, the, yep. You know, you mentioned that the pressure is to pass. Are you with me, John? I I'm you're breaking up a little bit. Hello. Yep, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah I you're frozen. That's why I asked. Um, you mentioned that banks have come come under pressure as deposits flow out. 
with the housing market possibly entering a slowdown um, as a result of the increased mortgage rates, it was going to be even more elusive to prospective buyers. Yeah, yeah. so, um, you know, uh, mortgage rates have definitely gone up. I had a slide and you actually took it out on mortgage rates. I should have left it in, I guess. But uh, mortgage rates have definitely gone up. Um, you know, they've come down a little bit here recently, but I think they're probably double what they were a year ago, something like that, uh, which I think always uh, prices out some people in the market. So I think that's that's happening. Uh, I think as banks, um, if and when the economy slows, banks will tighten credit quality standards. So that's going to hurt some um, uh, home buyers as well. So, you know, I, I, I think we're going to see a slowing of the market. Uh, prices are already starting to slow a little bit year over year. There's a, a survey called the K Schiller um, housing price index that comes out and it's actually starting to roll over year over year as far as prices go. But I will tell you, I had a neighbor uh, one street over sold his house just two days ago, got 12 offers in one day and sold it. Uh, for like 10% above asking price. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, uh, uh, we'll see. I, I, I think, I think credit quality or credit standards are going to get tighter and rates are going to stay higher for longer. So I think that is going to squeeze out some people in, in, you know, buying a home, uh, especially if, if your credit score is, you know, not in the top quartile or something like that. So, um, we'll see But again, I think a year from now, we could be talking about rates lower than they are today on the 10 year and you know that that could help and the other thing is you know at least in in, in my area um you know supply is still pretty low you, you look at uh, in our our neighborhood uh, there are not a lot of for sale signs up historically this time of year you're starting to see them pop up all over the place so i don't know if people are you know why they're not moving or or what the deal is but um so we'll see um uh but you know, housing is a big part of the economy, and um, you know, lower rates help help home builders. And I know the home builders have stocks have started to do pretty well here recently. Probably anticipation that that rates will start to come down, or have have started to come down, and will continue to come down. I should say. So, you know, with 2022 20, being a stressful year, and we we all heard of it. Everyone talked about it. We're hearing a lot about uncertainty, and that seems to be a word that a lot of people are using. Um, these nervous clients want to know what actions have we taken or are we considering to protect client assets during this period of volatility and uncertainty? Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> you know, we, we spent a lot of time on cash management. I know, uh, Debbie, you and I have had these conversations. Uh, trying to find, uh, so I was talking about money market rates not that long ago, trying to sweep some cash out of money market or out of the, what they call the bank sweep or the, the bank account uh, at the custodian in the money markets to get a better yield. We've been doing a lot of discussions on short-term cash needs and what are the other alternatives to get a better return, be it a, a money market or a short-term debt instrument or whatever that might be. On a, on a higher quality, not we're talking treasuries or agencies. We're not talking anything that has a, a credit, a high credit risk to it. So I think that's one part of it. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, over the last few quarters, you know, we, we were definitely much more defensive on our portfolio stands in the second half of the year than we were at the beginning. Um, starting to rethink that. And to be honest, we're probably starting to change a little bit. But that was one thing we've done. Um, you know, I think the other thing is not panicking. You know, we took some tax loss losses when we could that had to help clients uh, offset gains that may have either taken that year or, or, or to bank them going forward. So we've done that as well. Um, but I think, you know, the other thing is, you know, stay, stay allocated. Uh, we try to be uh, advantageous when we do rebalancing of the portfolios and, um, you know, kind of stay the course. But definitely, I think if, if and, we, and I've put this out before, but I'll do it again. If, if you're a client who you know is a little concerned in the short term, and you want to sit down and have a discussion with one of the investment team members, myself or uh, Rick D'Amico, who could definitely help on the on the cash end of things. Or uh, we have a new new member, uh, Mac Mur Murhead, would be happy to to uh, join a call. 
uh, we're happy to do that. Um, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't be quick to change your allocation at this point. I think we've kind of weathered the storm. But if there's something you know that, that is a concern, then you know we can talk about that as well. So uh, those are some of the things. But you know, we're always open to have conversations. Uh, you know, each each council a little different. Each obviously each client's situation is a little is unique. So um, help customize wherever we can for them. That's great. That's very reassuring. Thank you. Yeah. So let, let's move into the portfolios just to kind of, as I just, because we were just talking a second ago. So we have added to our technology and discretionary, uh, you know, as inflation and growth start to cool. Uh, you know, just as a side note, this is going to be a little inside baseball for most people. The S&P 500, which is the group uh, standard of course, which realigns companies in what sectors they're in, went through a whole realignment. So we, we've kind of gotten ours a little shuffled around, for example, uh, MasterCard and Visa used to be in information technology. They were put into financials and stuff. So we're we're reassessing all the changes. And you, so you might see some changes on this sheet the next time we come around, but we, we've been looking at it. But I think bigger picture is we've, we've looked at some of the areas like technology and discretion, which have led this so far this uh, year, the called the first four months. Uh, and I think, you know, we're, we're going to be shifting into what I think is a lower, a slower growth lower inflation environment probably over the next six to 12 months and i think some of those areas that do well um Ren, renmac does a study on market cycles and the areas that do well tend to be discretionary and technology so you know we want to kind of start to write write the ship a little bit and, and and look at those areas again uh probably won't go heavily overweight uh technology but at least trying to get back up to where we were before and again due to some of the shifting of the uh sectors we're a little off here and there um, but, uh, we're underweight utilities. I know you've had a question on that before. I don't know if you want to ask that now, since we're on the page. Yeah. Um, it kind of stands out that we didn't have any allocation to utilities. What's your outlook for that sector in 2023? So I will tell you, it's probably more of a philosophical thing than a, than an outlook. Um, you know, it's, it tends to be about 3%, somewhere between two and 3% of the index. So it doesn't really move a market much, uh, utilities. They tend to be heavily regulated by both state and federal, um, uh, regulatory agencies. And, you know, most people tend to buy them for the dividend, which is fine. I'd rather, if I were looking for dividend, uh, or dividend growth, I'd rather, I'd rather look at other areas. Uh, a great example I mentioned it this morning is Procter and Gamble. You know, it's it's raised its dividend every year for I think mm -hmm. 50 years in a row. Um, the earnings are growing. The 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 uh, sales are growing. They're buying new products. So, uh, you know, if utilities were like technology with 25 percent of the index, I'd have to own, we'd have to own them at least at some some point. But at two two or three percent. Uh, it's just not an area I think you get a lot of value out of. And, you know, there'll be years when, like last year, utilities would do well and it will hurt us. But, excuse me, there's years like this year where they're, it's doing poorly and it benefits us. I think it kind of washes out. Um, and I guess, you know, bottom line is just not an area I want to spend a lot of time on. So okay. that, that, that's, that's the philosophical reason. I, mean, I don't think we've owned a utility in 12 or 13 years. So it's been, wow. a while. it's been a while, uh, but again, if, if utilities were 10% of the index, that'd be a different story. I, I, that, then you have a, and this gets into, again, in the weeds, but you'd have a tracking area issue that would be much bigger and, and you'd have to, uh, be a little more, uh, sensitive to it. So. Sure. But, uh, so, yeah, so that's kind of where we're at today. As you can see the weighting differences over there to the right, uh, underweight technology, but my guess is you'll see that that delta of 1.47% start to wane or, or, or tighten. Um, you know, other end utilities, which we just talked about, we're underweight we, and we have been um, consumer discretionary, which is right in the middle there at 1.5, we're overweight there. Industrials are probably a little more overweight than we'd like to be. Again, that's more because of some of the realignment. So we're, we're making adjustments there, but I think Big picture, we like the sector and we'd be overweighted, probably not at the 3% level that we are currently today. So you see, could see some movement there. But I think, you know, we're moving away from that defensive uh, 
posturing and maybe more towards a neutral posturing with the anticipation of uh, maybe getting back to that slower, uh, 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 low inflation, slow growth environment, which tend to do well for growth stocks and what they call long duration stocks, which are the ones that got beat up last year, like technology and those. So um, keep, keep an eye on that. Uh, a lot can happen between now and then, but that's kind of our, our plot for the year. Uh, small caps continue to come under pressure, weighed down by the financials, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, you can see there they had a had a pretty good runoff the, at the beginning of 2022 relative to the market of the S&P 500. And then as we got into that uh, late February, early March issue with um, uh, Silicon Valley Bank and the, the uh, regional banks started to come down that they tend to have a pretty big weighting in small caps and, and they've been underperforming. I, I think I think the worst of that is over, but um, you know, again, we've not really added to our small cap positions much this year, kind of waiting to see the bottom on that. And it looks like there might be one forming. It's a little early, so I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. But um, and, and the other thing that that is, uh, that, you know, I think influencing market on, on a secondary level is the dollar. Uh, the dollar, uh, you know, relative to other currencies through 21 and into 22, as you can see in this, this big move up, uh, was appreciating or the dollar was gaining, uh, strengthening, if you want to call it that way. We've had a kind of a peak last called September, October, and it's been coming down. Kind of coincides right when the market's bottomed. So that might be that might be more than a coincidence. And then we're starting to see it come down. It kind of bottomed. We had a bounce. We see a second bottom here. My guess is, as an old friend of mine would say, gravity will take hold, and we'll see it kind of come down um, lower. So I think the trend is lower, and, and so far until that's changed, that's what we believe. That's that's one of the reasons we've seen the domestic, I'm sorry, the developed markets outperform the domestic markets this year, not by a lot, but by a slight amount. Uh, it did again in the fourth quarter. I think if we see more dollar uh, weakening, which means it goes lower. Um, we're likely to continue to see that. I, I, I kind of like emerging markets more than I like the developed markets, but again, there, there's probably just inherently a little more risk in the emerging markets, so it's something you have to be be aware of. But I think they have a better opportunity because I think uh, you know they have uh, better growth prospects going forward. And China seems like it's you know just starting to come out of its um, shutdown phase, and, and the consumers starting to spend money there. A lot, a lot of pent up demand, I think, in China. Um, so that's that's kind of where we're at. I got some things we're watching. I know we mentioned a few of them already. I'm happy to go through them. I don't know if there's any questions out there, um, or or if, if you have any questions, Deb, I'm I'm happy to. Um, we can pause here, or we can, I can keep going. Well, there is a question. Um, it's yeah. regarding interest rate hikes. Um, the fact that the Fed Fed's increasing interest rate heights gave us an opportunity to invest some of the custodial cash in clients' accounts into tradable money markets, which had a much higher interest rate, approximately 4%, mm -hmm. than, and the, versus the custodial cash, which was paying about four-tenths of a percent. What is our outlook on fixed income investing in 2023? Yeah, so uh, you know, I mentioned my colleague earlier, uh, Rick, Rick D'Amico, he, he heads up most of our fixed income um, investing. And, uh, you know, I, we talk all the time and, and and I think, you know, our thought is on at least where we're at today, it, it could change before the end of the year, but, you know, where we're at today, we still think the short end of the curve is attractive. So it's more that uh, call one to one to two years, probably more one, uh, uh, six, nine, and 12 months, but, but up to that two year range. Um, you know, strategically speaking, yields tend to peak right around the end of Fed tightening or, or close to it. So we've are, we may have seen rates peak. Uh, I think the ten years at three fifty seven, maybe something like that today. So, um, but we're still we're still looking at the short end of the curve. I think that's where the the best opportunities are. That could change as we get into the end of the year. Uh, the other part of that equation would be. Um, and reason I say we're on the short end of the region, so our duration is a little shorter than the benchmark, I guess is a, the more important thing to say. So our duration is a little shorter because we focus a little bit more on the shorter end of the curve. Uh, the second thing would be quality. You know, we, we've definitely uh, looked at, you know, stay on the high end of the quality and the investment grade corporate bonds. 
just because if there is a recession coming and if there's some credit qual quality issues or defaults or anything like that, you know, that'll affect um, uh, the spreads. So we've definitely stayed on the high end, uh, on the higher end of the quality spectrum. So I think that's kind of where we we're at today. Um, I'm trying to see if I, I don't want to make sure I missed all, I got all those points in, but um, you know, we, we definitely have been helping clients add to short-term treasuries, as you mentioned before. And, um, you know, I, I think you can take advantage of that, but, but again, at four, four, seven on, on a money market, that's pretty attractive as well. It's a liquid, it's a liquid instrument. Uh, you don't have to worry about selling it. Uh, so, you know, we, we have been using that as an investment, which is ironic because two years ago, um, again, I, I, we could put charts up on this as well, but two years ago, you're getting 20 basis points if you were lucky mm -hmm. on, a, on a money market. So it was really a, a non-event or a non-thought at that point. But now uh, it's definitely something we've been using in client accounts as, as an investment. And it's a tool with, you know, very little downside to them. So, uh, but I guess, the you know, the kind of, we kind of think the Fed's at the end of the cycle. We think uh, rates have either peaked or close to peaking if they haven't already. Uh, we're still short duration relative to the Bloomberg Ag, and still like that shorter end of the curve. I think you know where you're getting three, uh, four, or five percent on on Treasuries, um, and staying in the higher end of the quality range. That's kind of where we're at on fixed income today. Um, if we get a change and the Fed pauses and they start to move the other direction, maybe those things change. But I would say, uh, you know, to the short, inter short to intermediate time frame, I think that's kind of where we're at. Um, I saw a question pop up about China. Why is it an emerging market? And I'm happy to kind of just address it real quickly if, if you want me to. Sure. Yeah. So China, you know, China, much like uh, India and a couple other countries, are, are huge. They have a large population. Um, I, I'm not. I've, I've been to Hong Kong, but not China. But you go to these cities, they're like any other metropolitan city in the world, and you say, well, why are they considered emerging markets? A lot of it has to do with more with with the flow of flow of currencies, you know, uh, do they have a free floating currency? China does not, China manipulates their currency and they put constraints on where it can go and how, how it can go. Uh, they have constraints on foreign investment as does India for that example. India has a lot of constraints on foreign investments. So, um, you know, those are two of the main reasons why they're not considered developed markets re regardless of how big they are, um, you know, China being run by the communist country is never really going to give up control of the currency and most likely won't let somebody like GM come in and buy one of their car companies and own it outright. You know, they might let them do a joint joint venture or something like that. So those are the reasons why um, uh, they're considered emerging markets. Like, you know, again, China's second biggest economy in the world. You would think, well, if they can't be a developed market, who can? But But those are the reasons why. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, so, you know, so what are we watching? I, I mentioned at the beginning, the 4 things that we were kind of keeping a close eye on, but, um, so we, as we go into the 2nd quarter here, uh, you know, seasonal still look pretty good. 2nd quarter tend to be, you know, if you all go back to 1928, which I can't do the math in my head, but it's almost 100 years ago. Um, you know, you see the 2nd quarter tends to be a pretty good quarter and, you know, again, as, as we look at, um. Markets going forward, let's see if I missed one. Um, yeah, we, we think there's further upside here. Um, I, I, I do realize that there's going to be some pullbacks along the way. We could have a, a, a hiccup here with earnings. We could have a hiccup over the debt ceiling. There's a lot of things that are sitting out there that it could cause problems. China and uh, Russia are, 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 you know, forming a much more a lot big alliance than they have in the past. The war in Ukraine. There's a lot of things out there, so I'm not saying it's a it's a it's, it's a road without any any potholes on it. But I think we're going to see it on um, fire. This is just something Ned Davis puts out. It's really more directional than anything else, and they took it all the different ways. Uh, the one year cycle, the presidential cycle, which we talked about before, and, and the uh, the ten year decennial cycle, and they put it all together. And historically speaking, it's been a pretty good roadmap for where markets are going for the year. Uh, it would indicate much like the seasonal numbers that, you know, the second quarter, uh, you know, tends to be pretty good uh, in this environment. So we'll, you know, we'll see, we're keeping a close eye on it. Um, but, but um, so far it's the patterns held pretty well. Um, so, you know, another one of these, uh, 
you know, if you put in the, if the um, you know, hi hopefully history can hold on this one, but, you know, if the uh, previous year is down, like 2022 was, and the first quarter was up, um, you know, the rest of the year tends to be pretty positive. So, um, in fact, you know, every time that's happened since 1950, we've seen a positive return in the second through fourth quarter, so the last three quarters of the year. So, um, I wouldn't bet my house on that, but, but it's always one of those things you look at and say, well, you know, there's trends for a reason, and so far the trend has held. So, we're looking at that as well. Uh, but this this is the one that probably gives me the the most uh, gets me most excited that I think the market could have a upward bias throughout the end of the year is everyone is bearish, right? There's nobody out there that is pos positive on the markets. So this is a study JP Morgan does on a weekly basis, and I put a circle around the bottom too. So we're at 41 and change on the S and P. Uh, only. 5% of the market, 5.5 to be exactly, of the participants, I should say, think the market will go higher. Everybody else, so 94 plus percent, think the market's going to stay flat or go lower. Um, you know, the old saying, you know, be greedy when people are fearful and be fearful when people are, people are greedy. I, you know, I don't know if that applies to this or not, but there's not a lot of people here that are are uh, positive on, on markets. And JP Morgan's um, I don't, I forget the number, but it's a pretty large sample size. So it's not just one or two people they're interviewing. It's a pretty good large group. So, um, we'll see, um, you know, the crowd's rarely right on these things. So hopefully that's a good country indicator. Um, you have a, I know you had a question on gold. Do you want to ask the question or do you want to talk about gold? Sure. Um, you know, we always have clients ask about the purchase of gold in mm -hmm. the uh, ounce, especially in 2022 when inflation was high. Do you believe gold is a place in our portfolios? And if not, what about metals that are commonly used in manufacturing industry like um, copper, or titanium, or, or aluminum? Yeah, so uh, so gold first. This is a chart. It's a three-year chart. It's obviously consolidating. This is it, it hit a high. Uh, back in June of 2020, kind of retested that spot in March of 22. And then again, uh, which is ironic because in, I think this is about June, uh, June is when we saw the peak in inflation. So as inflation was going up, gold was going down, which kind of defeated the whole, it's a good hedge against inflation. And now that inflation is going down, gold is going up. So one of the arguments to hold gold in a portfolio is it's a great in, uh, inflation hedge. I would argue the last, at least the last two years, and some of the biggest moves in inflation we've seen in my lifetime, it didn't really hold up to where it was. Now, regardless to that, it still looks like it's breaking out. So um, we don't buy gold for clients. We have an own gold in, in client portfolios. It, it's it's a tough it's a tough uh, security if you want to call it that or asset to buy. It doesn't have a dividend. You know, you're paying a storage fee at some point, which just has an expense ratio to it. It's really speculative. So we haven't really bought it. Um, again, it doesn't really do what it's supposed to do, which is hedge inflation. So um, we we haven't really put a lot of time into buying into portfolios. We, we do have clients who will call and say, we want to buy some gold, and we're happy to help them do that and put it in their accounts, and we'll, we'll exclude it from the, the the account that we're working on, so we won't sell it. We would recommend doing that through an exchange traded fund. We usually use something like a some called GLD or something it has a pretty low expense ratio. That's there's other ways. There's some mutual funds you can do it. You could buy physical gold, but then you have to store it, and there's other issues to that. So uh, we'd recommend the ETF route. But but again, we, we're happy to have that conversation if anybody does. Uh, on the second part of that, um, you know, as far as the metals go, you know, there, there's a lot of miners out there like Freeport McNaran, uh, Newmont, Newmont Mining that, you know, mine uh, either precious metals or iron ore or those type of things. Uh, Rio Tinto is another one out there uh, that, you know, we've owned in the past. Uh, they tend to be pretty, pretty cyclical, kind of volatile. They do, they're, they're usually tied to the, the costs. And if you look over the last, uh, you know, 10 years, uh, absent of the last last year, inflation has been pretty tame. So 
we haven't really done much with commodities because of that. They tend to do well in a rising interest rate environment or rising inflation environment, which which they did last year, and, and we missed that one. Uh, but I think inflation's peaked. So um, I guess to answer your question, we have looked at the metals. We've looked at a few of the, the mining companies specifically as a as a way to play that that not buying the, the commodity itself. Um, we just haven't really seen them uh, um, as attractive at this point. But but um, um, Mac, our new our new uh, portfolio manager, and I were actually just talking about some of the miners um, yesterday. So it's something that's on the radar. Good to know. Yeah, um, and then just you know. Uh, last one, but you know the the Fed rarely hits the bullseye, you know, the, and and they're talking right now about a two percent Fed target on inflation. It's the magic number. I, I I would not be surprised at some point either late this year or early next year we're talking about deflation again because they have they have you know the Fed tends to raise interest rates until they go too far, and you know. It shows in, in years past that you know they they rarely hit the target down here, and um, uh, it's a long way to go. And I'm not making any predictions here, but uh, the thought that inflation drops to two percent stops sits there because that's the Fed target, and then stays there for you know until they decide to raise again is unlikely. So uh, we we could end up seeing a point where they they raise too they go too far too fast on raising rates. And then inflation starts to go down and picks up steam like it like it very well could be recently. And then we get in the point where we're talking about uh, deflation again. So we'll see. Uh, maybe maybe this is the time they hit the target at 2% with the uh, magic inflation number. But uh, I, I'm always a little skeptical on that. So as I said earlier, you know, we're looking at the Fed. We're looking at watching interest rates, earnings, um, all those things, the economy. And I think this is one of the things we're watching. You know, where, where is where do they stop? Where do they stop? And then where does inflation stop afterwards? So um, that's a lot of considerations. Yeah. Well, never a dull moment. And you know, like I said, it's been three years since the market bottom in March, and I thought that was a stressful time. It seems like the last three years with the market gyrations and all the stimulus putting into the system, now all the stimulus being taken out of the system, and the uh, pandemic spending, and then we had the uh, infrastructure spending. Uh, to your point earlier, one working against the other. There's a lot of moving parts out there, and you know it's it's uh, you know we spent a lot of time not only on you know the individual equities and the stocks and stuff, but just looking at the macro environment and, and yeah. you know what the tea leaves are saying, so to speak. So well, I, I, that's it for me. I I think I have to scroll through for some of these um, these. Uh, Disclosures, but is there any other questions out there that came in? I'm happy to go through them if, if there are. No. No. Okay. We're we're good right now. All right, Deb. Well, as always, it's a pleasure pleasure working with you. Um, that I appreciate everybody that dialed in, and you know, I, I as I always say, I, I appreciate all the help from marketing, uh, getting this up and running, and uh, making us look good. So, and I and the investment team with with their help on getting the stuff together. So thanks. Hey, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, and thank you, Jen, for taking the time. Oh, no if problem. you're able to get to anyone's questions today, the investment team and or your advisor will reach out to you directly. Finally, it's our privilege to inspire you and your family. And we feel sincere gratitude for your trust and loyalty. We can't thank you enough. Um, and we thank you for joining us today. See you next quarter. Bye-bye.